So welcome to the next installment of the Department of Local Government, Sport and Cultural Industries, Coach and Officials Development Series. My name is Orazio Santa Lucia, and I work in regional services based in the Peel office. Throughout this series, we hope to deliver um, a podcast or vodcast webinar series to assist coaches along their development journey, no matter what level that they are at. Today, we are very fortunate to have um, returning to the, the podcast, podcast series, Jamie Douse. Jamie Douse is the uh, West Australian Football Commission Southwest Talent and Coaching Manager, as well as heading up the SWAS, the Southwest Academy of Sport AFL program. Welcome back to the, uh, the show, Jamie. Thanks, Horatio. Um, thanks for having me back, Matt. Uh, thank you for, for coming along. Um, now, we've been very fortunate to have worked uh, to, together in the past and, and um, you know, you're a wealth of knowledge. You, you're a, a stalwart in the Southwest region, especially around AFL circles, but you've, uh, you've obviously been um, part of some other programs. Um, you've been part of the cricket program in the past and you've done some, some other sort of things as well. But um, what we're going to talk about today in particular is a is a, is a coaching philosophy, a coaching movement that's um, big across most sports at the moment, and that's game-based coaching. So with that in mind, what, what, what do you see game-based coaching as being? How can we describe it? Uh, so the, the literature would uh, call it either game sense coaching or um, teaching, uh, teaching using games, mm -hmm. and it's like in a in a broad sense, um, using games within your training programs to try and teach, you know, players objectives that relate specifically to games, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to the the traditional model that a lot of us grew up on, which was very much around um, specific skills being being taught using drills, um, yeah. where where you might just you know, focus on certain aspects of a drill, um, which probably didn't have much relevance to the actual game day environment. So mm -hmm. by by adopting a games approach, we can um, use that to try and elicit greater learnings uh, with the athletes that we're coaching. Yeah. You, do you think that um, it's probably more a modern sort of uh, phenomenon, I guess, um, because we don't, as a society, we don't play as much. So um, if we go back to 20, 30 years ago, I guess when we may have been um, young, younger, younger people uh, running around and, and enjoying sport for, for what it was, um, we would have played a lot of um, games. Like we would have played a you know, mock-up footy game or mock-up game of cricket or mock-up game of basketball where it's just, you just play wherever you are and you just play. So be it a, a, a patch of grass where, okay, we're going to play a footy game and we're going to use trees as goals or jumpers as goals or something along those lines where that's not done as much. So that natural learning doesn't quite happen. Do you see that? Is that why we've sort of moved down this road, you think? Uh, potentially. Um, the, the concept itself has been... Um, I think it might date back even to the to the late 60s, um, but has really only come into prevalence probably the last 20 years, which mm -hmm. would, the timing of that fits in with, with what you're suggesting. Um, we certainly, and it's well documented that, you know, um, kids these days probably don't play like we did 20, 30 years ago for, uh, mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons. Um, so, you know, potentially the fact that they're not playing, they're not learning the intricacies of, of game play. Um, so by, by bringing that into our coaching practice, um, we can maybe offset um, some of the learning that they're not doing away from structured training now. Um, but it's interesting that you say that because we do hear it a lot about, you know, kids just don't play as much anymore and when we think back to when we played um, it was very much driven by us 
you know, mm -hmm. there, there were no adults around to to ruin it. No. Um, there were no adults around to affect rules and tell us what to do and how we had to do it. Yeah. And it was probably that aspect that, you know, really led to our learning and, and enjoyment. Mm -hmm. um, so we bemoan the fact that it doesn't happen anymore, yet a lot of coaches fail to recognise that. And then at training, um, they it fail to make it fun, fail to adopt a game approach. Yeah. Um, and probably fail to see the environment through the um through the eyes of the athlete mm -hmm. um you know and, and if we can think back to that ourselves then that can really help guide what we deliver at training so i might have gone off track a little there but i've just it's just something i've been thinking about recently because we do hear a lot about coaches saying you know these days kids just you know they they don't learn they don't practice away from structured training mm -hmm. yet we don't create a fun and engaging environment ourselves a lot of the time yeah and that's why i've got you on involved jamie because i know you're a deep thinker of, uh, of coaching and you're able to uh, <laughs> share your knowledge um which is fantastic for everyone that's listening and uh watching here so with that in mind um what what are the pros and cons of of this uh philosophy i guess um because um, you know, we can sit, we can sit here and sort of say, "Hey, this is all great," and and there will be some uh, some some benefits you're going to be able to highlight here, no doubt. But there's also going to be some, um, you know, very good. There's there's going to be something probably not so good, and it, I think it's it's a good opportunity now to probably highlight those. So what we'll start with the good because we're, we're nice. Um, so what what are the benefits you see of of this sort of philosophy of coaching? Uh, well, the first thing is probably the fact that we're playing games can is more fun. Mm -hmm. um, so just referencing back to what I was saying before, if, if training is fun, then the participants are more engaged and they're, they're more likely to stay engaged. And mm -hmm. from a you know, participation perspective, the more that we keep um, kids involved in sport, the better. So if training's fun and they keep coming back, well, then that's that's a massive bonus. Um, the the game sense approach, you know, lends itself to greater teaching of what happens in a game. So you can take something from a game and bring it into your training environment, mm -hmm. um, and you can really focus and hone in on certain aspects that you want to develop. Um, there's also the the fitness aspect. So there's plenty of evidence to suggest that using games instead of drills or structured um, conditioning type sessions is, is just as effective at developing physical fitness. So, you know, a lot of the time coaches are, are searching for ways to um, make, get their athletes fit. Um, so they'll spend time specifically focused on conditioning and, and not actually practicing the skills associated mm -hmm. with the game. Um, and when we've got limited time, we want to maximise the amount of time that we have to um, teach aspects of the game. So using a game sense approach, you can develop fitness and also greater understanding of, of what's happening within games. Um, so they're probably, they're probably the three big ones. Sorry, mate. Yep. So with the fitness element there, it's sort of like um, what parents have done for, for years with, with hiding veggies in the in the pasta sauce and something like that, isn't it? So that, they don't quite know that they're getting, uh, they're building on their, their fitness um, base uh, with a lot of running because they're chasing a ball or something like that. But at the end of the day, they're actually getting some good kilometres in the legs. And um, if you're measuring, as, as you do with a lot of your sessions with um, you know GPS systems and all that sort of stuff, you probably see that they're, they're hitting similar markers to what uh, a running specific program might have might have been. Yeah, a, a very good analogy, mate. Hiding it within the um, within the structure of the session. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, when we're working, well, a athletes of any age, really, there are some that just do not like the you know the physical conditioning side of it. So, yeah. if if we adopt specific practices in training and and we you know effectively we take a lot of the fun out of it, mm -hmm. there will be athletes that will stop coming back because they don't like it so 
um, you can get, get just as good benefits from, you know, well-designed um, games within your training sessions. We've, we've um, put GPS specifically on, on kids at training to try and highlight the amount of work that you can get done um, through uh, playing games and yep. maximising the amount of touch that players have within training sessions. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's no need to be doing specific work. You can use the games as long as they're well, you know, well structured. Yep. And, and that's probably where um, one of the cons may be in, in that um, once you get the handle of this, it, it does become quite um, simple to see, I guess, and, and sort of be able to adapt um, a specific scenario you might take out of your specific sport that you want to work on in a game-based sort of um, methodology. But if you're brand new to coaching, brand new to the sport, one of the downsides I'd see with, is actually identifying those uh, moments and being able to recreate it at, at training. Would you, would you sort of agree with that? That it can be difficult, as simple as it sounds, it's actually quite difficult to, to implement yeah, if you want to maximise um, its use, then yeah, it can be quite difficult and it requires a fair bit of uh, creativity and, and imagination mm -hmm. to think outside the box and come up with ideas that you can use at training to you know, elicit the greatest benefits. Yeah. Um, I think, like, using it just anyway instead of drills... Mm -hmm. um, is probably going to be beneficial because we expose athletes to patterns. So, you know, whether, whether or not we've designed it well, there is that aspect of it where, you know, the athlete is seeing patterns that may then transfer to actual game play. Yeah. Um, so there's still benefit there, but are we getting the most out of it? Um, so yeah, we, we need to really consider what we are trying to teach. And yes, that can be quite difficult when you're new to coach. It's difficult, you know, if you're an experienced coach, mm. um, to come up with, with games that really meet, um, the needs of, of your, um, program and, and what you are trying to achieve out of your, your game day play. Yeah. Um, yeah, so probably the tendency initially is to, is to have a game and you have in mind what you want it to do. So you have a focus and then you try and direct the players to achieve your exact focus. Mm -hmm. um, and there, there can be a tendency to overcoach. Um, and then you, you, know, you minimize the benefits of the players exploring options through the game itself. Yeah. And then on the flip side, there's probably the potential for the game just to, to be played with actually no input from the coach, um, which you know, you're not getting the maximum benefits out of, out of either of those two scenarios. Um, but, you know, but when you're first starting coaching, it's very easy to adopt either of those practices mm -hmm. in, in your game sense coaching. So... Um for those that are probably listening or, or watching and they're still contemplating what a game sense type um, session may look like, um, and, and we can use um, invasion games because they're probably the easiest ones to work with to start with. So be it a, a soccer, a basketball, or, or football, or rugby. Um, what, what, what would a, a game based, a typical game based sort of um, session, and typical is probably not the right word there, but how, how could you set, sort of set the scene? So you've got a, a specific area of, we'll use AFL as an example, you've got a specific area you want to work on. What, what's a game-based sort of session look like? Um, so the structure of a, of a session would, you know, just your general warm-up, yep. um, where, again, you still uh, maximise the use of, of footies or, you mm -hmm. know, whether it's basketball, basketball, soccer balls, whatever it might be. Um, and even within your your warm ups, you can you can try and use 
um, specific movements that might carry over to to what you're going to do in your, in your session. So we try and do a lot of um, uh, a lot of one v one type work in our warm ups, where and not necessarily always with a footy, but just about uh, going one on one against someone and and starting to read body cues, yeah. so that when you do transfer that to the game or or to your game uh, use of game sense coaching at training, there's actually a bit of transfer mm -hmm. um, to the to the game play itself. So after you warm up, I, I would always try and go with games before you know any sort of specific skill drills, um, for one of a one of better word, drills or yeah. you know sort of isolating skills. So mm -hmm. go with the games first, um, and you can even use small sided games in your warm up. Um, I would. In a warm up, I would tend to have a bigger playing area so that minimise the, um, you know, the rapid changes of direction while the the athletes are still warming up. And then into your session itself is, you know, introduce a game that has elements of what you want to focus on from, you know, whether it's the weekend's game or whether it's just your the game style that you're trying to coach. Um, introduce that get the game flowing and then as the game uh, proceeds try and avoid constantly stopping and, and giving feedback allow it to flow um, start to notice the patterns that are occurring and then when you do bring players in is to try and ask leading questions so that they start it really forces them to start thinking about you know, what they're doing, what the outcomes are. Um, when I do this, this happens. When you do this, this happens. And more often than not, the players can actually identify what's going on. Um, and it's it's not necessarily age restricted. So even, even young kids playing sport know what's happening and they can, you know, they can talk about it and tell you what's happening mm -hmm. within the game. So try and ask leading questions so that the players start to feel comfortable yeah. being able to give their thoughts on what's happening. Can and you if you're doing that, it gives you a great idea. Sorry, mate. Can you give an example of what a leading question may sound like? Again, for, for those coaches that are listening and sort of thinking, what, what sort of questions do I use? Because again, that, that's, that's going to be part of the skill they're going to work on and develop as a coach um, to draw the answers out of the players. Yeah, and it, in saying that, um, a lot of the time you do ask questions and, and you get crickets. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and then we have that tendency to, to fill in all the answers mm -hmm. um, and defeats the purpose of, of what we're doing. So initially, uh, you really have to expect that there's going to be periods of awkward silence. And rather than try and fill in the gaps is is to try and change your questioning and come from a different angle. And hopefully with time, your players get more comfortable answering questions. Um, so just to sidetrack a little, it's in our talent programs, most of the kids that come in um, have never been exposed to that type of questioning. Mm -hmm. So when we ask questions, we, we very rarely get answers initially um, but it's important that we persist and sometimes it might take three or four months before players start to feel comfortable where they can give answers without fear of of being wrong or ridicule um, from either coaches or peers because those things do happen so patience is the first thing and then the types of questioning observe what's happening within the game and okay when we do this what what is the result um and then from there you can you can flow on and, and if you say to players okay this happened uh why did that happen what were the, what were we doing that caused that to happen um, and they, they will generally come up with the answers to those types of questions and 
well, they're asking the, the question. <laughs> Sorry, mate. They're the ones involved. So yeah, I have got the answers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and, and when you ask them the question, their answers tell you their level of understanding, but they also tell you what's happening from their perspective yeah. inside the game. Which is important. Yeah, well, they're the ones playing it. Yeah. So then when they answer a question, the temptation can be to just go on to what you want to go on to next. Mm -hmm. And then there's a real art in being able to explore that with the athlete. So they give you an answer. That's okay, that's, that's interesting. How did that come about? What's that leading to? What can we change about that? What's good about that? And, and again, they'll, they'll come up with the answers. Mm. Um, it just requires a, you know, careful probing and, and patience. Yeah. And, and you, you, you touched on something there um, which, which resonated with me there where, where um, you're asking the athletes, okay, so why, why do you think that happened and what can we change in order to um, get our objective or our goal or, or whatever it is that we're trying to get out of the session? Um, a brave coach um, can just let them come up with the next step. Because again, they'll, they'll know. They, they will have, they'll, they'll go, well, hang on, if we do this, this and this, I reckon we'll get outcome B. And then as a coach, you can go, okay, go. Let's try it. Absolutely. Yeah, we do that a lot. Um, mm. Okay, there's a lot of congestion here. What can we do within this game? Um, to reduce the congestion and then let the players come up with solutions. Some of them will work, some of them won't. Um, yep. But it, it also gives them ownership in their learning. And mm. if there's ownership in the learning, that it's more likely to sink in. Yep. Um, so yeah, it can be hard for coaches to, to give up that control. You, but when you allow athletes to, to have that level of input and to have a choice, you just get so much more cut through with your coaching and, and the relationships that you build with your players. Um, and why not Why not within games, like give them a coaching board and, and some magnets and ask them to start coming up with, you know, scenarios or, or solutions to problems using visual aids like that. We, yeah. we do that with our uh, some of our football groups is... Um, at training, we'll give them a board and some magnets and, and give them the idea of a game and send them away. And they they go go away, have a look at it, and then come back in and, and try and implement what they've demonstrated on the board. Um, mm -hmm. it, it just they're the ones playing the game. So let's, let's let them try and come up with solutions because that's what we want on game day. Yeah. So let's do that at training instead of us just dictating the terms all the time. Yeah. But mate, you, like you, you hit the nail on the head, it, it takes a brave coach. And we think we have to be the ones with, with all the answers, mm -hmm. but, but we can't possibly have the answer to everything. Um, sometimes the game just has to teach mm. instead of us trying to tell all the time. So with that, you'd see um, a good way for a coach to sort of walk away is, is that you're a facilitator for learning rather than being the, uh, the encyclopedia or, or the, the Google of, um, of, of that coaching group or that, that um, particular team. You're, you're the facilitator. So you're the actual, um, you're the computer that gives them the access to Google. If you want to think of it one, yeah, yeah. one way, you know, or, or you're the internet. Yeah, exactly, mate. And you you facilitate that learning through your questioning and giving players choice. I yeah. saw it referred to as a um, uh, as an architect, which is, is similar to what you're saying. You know, we we just create training environments that facilitate that player learning. Yeah, I like I like that a lot. Um, now, something I've observed from a, a couple of sessions that I've uh, been lucky enough to to work with you, Jamie, was that um, you don't carry many cones with you. So uh, as a coach, a coach will have, you know, buckets of, of cones or racks of cones and all that sort of stuff. And, and some of the sessions I've observed with you, there, there's not a cone in sight. And, and you're, when I asked you, you, you basically said, 
well, we don't play with cones, so why are we going to use them here at training? Um, is, is that, I mean, is, is there anything more to, to go with that? Because I, I, I love that. I love that philosophy where you just said, no, no, we don't, we don't need them. Yeah, um, that was probably a few years ago, was it? Yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, and look, there's time. Yeah, look, and I, I, yeah, yeah, you're right, mate. There are times where you do. I still generally don't use them. Hmm. Uh, other than to mark off playing areas. Yeah. Um, yeah, so to mark out your grids, yeah. Um, this year, I think for the first time in in five or six years with one of our talent groups, I actually used cones for a cricket, uh, kicking drill. Mm -hmm. And the, the main reason was, was we wanted players to start in a certain spot and then move to another spot. Yeah. Um, so it was really just as a guide because without it, everything just collapsed. Mm -hmm. So I, I, that's probably the first time in three or four years that I've used cones in that manner. Yeah. That was with 15 to 16 year olds. Um, and it was actually really effective in teaching what we were trying to teach. Mm -hmm. But we initially, we set everything up. And after a couple of weeks, the players ran the cones out to the positions where, where they needed to be. And then a couple of weeks further removed, the players did the activity without the cones being in place. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then it became a bit more game-like, throwing defenders in. Um, so we did transition from using them to to removing them yeah. and outside of that yeah we, we're just trying to avoid using them as much as possible yeah for coaches of of younger athletes though they certainly have have their place in in structuring training sessions and and having a little bit of control yeah yeah no no, no doubt especially um if you are setting up your small side of games um and you're using yeah. an oval that you're sharing it could be you know a lot of um a lot with, with the growth of sport and, and uh, community sport and some of the, um, especially with um, the, the growth in the female sort of uh, participation, for instance, club facilities are stretched, aren't they? So when they had four yeah. using an oval, now there's probably eight teams using an oval. So you've got to, well, okay, you've got that corner, you've got that corner and you've got to do it. So yeah, you, you've probably got to mark out a zone, but um, sort of allowing it to be chaotic and a bit messy actually replicates what a game day environment sort of looks like, doesn't it? And, and, and again, sometimes that's a bit scary for a coach to sort of go, oh, but, yeah. you know, there's people running around everywhere and it's chaotic. You get, but that's that's what the game looks like. Yeah, it's um, uh, you're spot on. And that's the environment ideally we create hmm. because in, in invasion sports, that's what happens during the game. It, you it's very difficult to control what the opposition do, um, particularly outside of elite sport where, you know, we, we don't have five or six training sessions a week and, and education sessions. So it's very difficult to control what the opposition do. Games are chaotic. So the more we expose players to that in training, the better. And, and when you think about cones, um, they're used as a starting point and a finishing point. And when, when we use them, they become a switch off. So the player knows I leave here and then I go to there. And after being involved in, in whatever it is, their pure focus is to run to the next cone. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, which isn't, which isn't game life at all. No, no, not, not at all. Um, Okay, so that, that sort of leads into what um, another sort of area I wanted to touch on, which is constraints-led coaching. And, and cones can come into that, no doubt. Um, so for, for those that don't understand, they sort of link together. So what, what would a constraint-led coaching session or activity look like? Um, yeah, it's, they are quite similar. And... The game sense, some practitioners 
are now applying constraints led to game sense. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Shane Peel, uh, who's in South Australia, he's he's a very strong advocate of game sense approach, and I've seen some of his work where he's starting to implement. Um, the constraints led approach in his game sense coaching. Yeah. Um, so we're looking at constraints, if we're looking at the constraints of an athlete, um, there's the individual constraints. So the constraints of the athlete themselves, yeah. um, which might be, you know, genetics, height, weight, uh, that type of thing. Even if we're looking at uh, skill acquisition, even, even things like limb length, uh, where we have a model in our minds of what's a perfect technique, mm -hmm. but athletes all present with different constraints. Um, so, you know, how do those constraints impact on the ability to perform what we have in our mind as, as a perfect technique? Yeah. Um, and then there's also the, the emotional side, you know, and the mental side that can be a constraint within an individual. Mm -hmm. uh, environmental constraints, which can be, you know, the environment that we're playing in, whether that's indoor or outdoor. If it's outdoor, obviously, there's a lot more constraints there and we have very little control over those constraints. Um, and environmentally, that could also be, you know, a family unit, um, socioeconomic status. Yeah. Um, so those things as an extension of environmental constraints and then there's the the task constraint so mm -hmm. this is probably where you know we, we apply it more from a, a coaching perspective which might be rules regulations that we impose at training it might be the equipment that we use um, and again even even the size of the playing area can be a, a constraint scoring opportunities can be a constraint yeah. um, so you know, they're, they're the three categories of constraints mm -hmm. um, and how they sort of broadly might apply to our coaching practice. Yeah, definitely. So um, I, I, I could come up with an example here. Um, a, a bowling coach in cricket might use a constraint of um, a narrow sort of channel. And this is a physical constraint, I guess, um, to, to keep the bowling alignment going in a nice straight line. So they'll they'll create a, a channel of either cones, and we go back to cones, or um, a line of stumps, um, or even the, um, the agility poles, you know. So basically, yeah. they might feel tight and, and restricted, and they've got to complete their bowling action. And the, the thinking there is you do that enough times, it becomes your new, um, you know, motor skill. That you're, you're adapting your motor skill to be able to do that without the constraints. Um, so hopefully you take the constraints away and then they're going to be able to perform the skill to a certain, well, to the level that you're sort of wanting them to achieve. That'd be one simple one that sort of stands out. And that's just using a, a cricket as an example there. Um, football, I mean, you, you put plenty of constraints in place to teach uh, a style, for instance, wouldn't you? Yeah. Um, just to get back to your, your cricket example i saw uh yesterday an example in cricket of um putting different colored tape on the fingers of a bowler so a spin bowler so that the batsman could um pick up the cues yeah yeah i thought that that's what a fantastic idea mm -hmm. um back to like a ball sport like footy um like kicking is a very complex skill um, particularly in uh, Australian rules football or, or some of the rug or, or the rugby codes where the player has to move the ball from their hand to their foot. Yeah. Um, so it's a really complicated skill. And, and when people are initially learning that, um, what constraints can we put in place that actually might make it easier? So a constraint could be with uh, Australian rules is to use a, a soccer ball mm -hmm. instead of a football to allow the, the participant much easier access to performing the skill. So by using a round ball, it's easier to drop it from your hand to your foot and then to make reasonable contact 
um, of the service. service. It's a hit, isn't it? Yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, if it's if it's little kids that are still learning, is um, use bigger balls. So you know, why not something like a beach ball, where all we're worried about is the actual success in making contact with the ball with our foot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then going to the extreme is to perhaps use a smaller ball, like a tennis ball. So there we're really constraining uh, the technique and it, and it requires you know, a, quite a good technique to be able to hit yeah. such a small ball, which makes me think about uh, what we do with, with junior football is use smaller footballs because they're easier to grip. Yeah. Um, but they're much harder to make contact with and you know, re require really, really good motor skills. Mm -hmm. um, so how can we allow more success? Um, and if you look at, uh, again, cricket, what, what has cricket done to uh, make it easier for younger participants in, in playing so cricket? The balls, um, that, you know, you roll it along the ground, um, you shorten the pitch, that's the big one, the, the junior formats. That's been the biggest change in, in Australian cricket over the last three or four years, um, the implementation of the junior formats. And, and the big one of that is, is number of players. So to cut back on the number of players, especially at the junior junior levels um, on the field. So there's more area for batters to be able to score. Um, yep. the, the, the pitch, of the, the, the length of the pitch. Um, so it enables a bowler to be able to, get the ball to the other end a lot easier, especially if you, when you're younger and you, you don't have the physical strength to be able to do it. Um, it'd be quite recent. I mean, it's recent-ish is, is the ball. I mean, I know we've just discussed there about bigger, smaller ball, but for smaller hands, use a smaller ball. Um, for a smaller body, use a smaller bat. Um, yeah. Now, a long, long time ago, a cricket bat would be handed down so, you know, father, yeah. son or something like that. And, well, if you're 10 and the bat's half your, half your height, it's not, it's not going to work. And these days, half your weight. Yeah. So they're the sort of constraints that have sort of come in to, to cricket, as an example. Um, football, um, well, AFL I've seen as a coaching tool, um, which uh, an AFL coach is uh, using, I guess he sells them. Um, the, yeah. the mark, mark footballs, aren't they? So, you know, kick, kick the red zone or kick the yellow zone or whatever it is, but th those visual cues are constraints, I guess, to a certain extent, and that uh, enables the players to focus a little bit more on this, the kicking skill. And, well, I believe that it's making some progress with the kicking anyway, as, as an example. Yeah. Yeah, I think it is. Uh, for a while there, the... Um the WA Football Commission, all the footballs that they distributed had the hands marked on the side of the footy as a guide. So, yeah, that's, that's a constraint. Yeah. Um, I, again, on, um, on cricket, I think, and I'll, I'll probably get a little sidetracked here, but I, I, something I think we've spoken about previously with cricket is the application of constraints that perhaps don't lend themselves to being beneficial um, and, and cricket by nature, especially as a batsman, um, you know, in a game you can go out and you're out first ball. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you get that practice time? So cricket's solution was for players to be able to bat for a certain amount of time in, in junior sport, which was uh, four overs, was it? Uh, yeah, well, they still they still do. I mean, batters get uh, twenty odd balls or the, yeah, something like along those lines. Anyway, so it's still four overs. So then that doesn't teach the value of you know stroke play so that you you keep your wicket. Mm -hmm. So they're in a they're in a really tough situation where you need time in the middle, but you can be out first ball and then you don't get you might not get the opportunity to bat again for two weeks. Yeah. Um, but then they almost cheapen, cheapen it by everyone gets four overs for a hit. Um, so yeah, those constraints probably work for and against cricket in some aspects. Yeah. Um, sorry, Matt, I got sidetracked. 
No, 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 that's that's fine. And that, that's going to be a question that a lot of um a lot of coaches will have there and in their particular sports, especially at the uh, the foundation levels, uh, doing everything they can to maximise participation and find ways to to um, involve and, and be as inclusive as they can, which is which is quite important. I mean, at the end of the day, we want um, as 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 much of our population to enjoy the benefits of sport um, that we so love and invest in, um, be it in, in the many ways that we we do invest. Um, so, so that's always going to be a challenge. I mean, there's, there's yeah. a thing there alone for, for the coach, let alone the, um, the participants. Um, but as you mentioned there, so that what there are pro, there are obviously some really good things to take out of a, a constraint-led coaching sort of style or philosophy, but there's also um, the, the cons in that um, it's not real a lot of the time. Um, you, you take away some of the decision-making which we've tried to implement in the game-based sort of style. Um, so it's it's probably a, a skill acquisition method rather than a game um, method. So you know, you're trying to work on a particular skill, not all the time, but that, that's probably something, one of the outcomes you're going to get or you're aiming for, whereas in the game-based, you're skilled part of it but you're you're teaching the game because you can be the most skilled you can be the best kick in the world but you don't know how to play football or soccer or rugby well okay you're good at kicking but it doesn't mean you can play the game yeah um so um that's where you try and blend the two so those those skills that are relevant to the specific game how can you make them adaptable Mm -hmm. so that you can adapt to to what the game and what the game environment throws at you. So, yeah, and that it starts to get you know, quite deep when um, we go right into the constraints led approach because it is it is based on ecological dynamics and and systems thinking. Yeah. Um, so there there isn't that element of making the skill adaptable to the game and creating environments that are representative of mm-hmm. um, the game environment. Um, so uh, that's probably been another shift in in sports and across all sports. So some examples might be, you know, for rock climbing athletes, do they do indoor climbing or is it more beneficial to do outdoor climbing? Um, by placing them in an indoor environment, are the constraints, you know, too great? And is it really reflective of, of what happens in the actual environment? Um, so yeah, it gets it gets quite complicated when you start really delving into it. Yeah. Um, but I think it, it it doesn't. A lot of the research does show that it's it's quite beneficial in in teaching the game itself, but mm-hmm. it, it does require you know, a bit of knowledge and um, I, I mentioned earlier that capacity to think outside the box. Yeah. Um, but there's probably a lot of coaches that are doing it that have never heard of constraints-led approach but are, are actually already doing it. Yeah. And, and if we go back to the um, one of our initial discussions uh, in today's uh, episode, um, we mentioned about play and natural play and, and the sort of things that we probably were exposed to 20 or 30 years ago um, in our youth that um, uh, it's, I'm not saying that doesn't happen now but but not it's not as prevalent and, and that is the constraints that were there in our, our backyard for instance so yeah. um, there, there's plenty of examples and, and I can I can use cricket as an example here um, where players learn to bat in a particular way because that was the shape of their backyard and they knew that if they yeah. hit the ball yeah. on the offside they're going to hit mum's um you know prize winning roses there and life's not worth living so you learn yeah. it all on the other side of, of, the, of the backyard and then before you know it you become a very good leg side sort of cricketer um you know yeah. or, or bar, you know but whatever, whatever the sport there, there's plenty of stories where you learned how to play in your environment because that's what you had that's all you had um you know there's the the don bradman theory golf ball against the uh the corrugated iron water tank and the stump you know that that's a yeah. famous famous story um 
that, but that was his backyard. That was what he had. Yeah, and that's a, a great example of constraints. Um, there's one, I can't remember what book it was. It was either, it was Bounce or Outliers, mm -hmm. something like one of those books about a table tennis player who um, played table tennis at school, but the end of the table, there was enough space for him to stand and then there was a wall. So he became very, very good at um, playing in that really tight confines. But when, when there was space, he, yeah, he didn't have the skills to be able to do that. So the constraint actually, I think it might have been bounce because I think, I think he was that's a the, that's the, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, in the show notes, we might put some links to, to about, um, a couple of the books that we've, uh, we've both read, um, yeah. probably devoured uh, some of the, the content knowledge in there. So um, just to give um, coaches that are listening and watching this um, an opportunity to maybe go and do some outside reading. And there'll be some links to some uh, other websites yeah. as well that'll uh, just enhance the learning here. Yeah. Uh, so just to sort of wrap things up here, Jamie, I really appreciate your time and um, I hope everyone sort of uh, really enjoyed this uh, 40 odd minutes or so that we've been able to uh, have a good discussion here. Um, would you would you recommend, if we go back to game-based coaching, would you recommend getting to a point where um, you, you nearly hand over a session to your players? So where you, you're sort of comfortable enough to go, right, okay, this is what we want to get design it, like let, let them sort of go with it. Yeah. Yeah, we, um, that's where we try to get to with um, our 16 year old talent groups. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're at an age where we hope they have some, some deeper understandings of the game and, and can start to take a bit of control. Um, yeah. And uh, admittedly, it took five or six months to get to that point where they're comfortable to do it. Um, in that environment, we're bringing kids together from you know, all over a, a vast region. And, and it can take a long time for the kids to feel comfortable amongst themselves. But if you've got a, a team that you coach on a weekly basis that you have all, all year round, then that would be an ideal outcome mm -hmm. that your players can come to training and, and have massive input into what happens at training. Yep. Um, whether or not you hand it over the whole session over, that depends on your playing group and you know what their strengths are and, and whether they mm -hmm. actually have the capacity to do that. Yeah. And, and that's a over time ultimate goal coaches there. can start that process at a at a younger age. Like don't be afraid to let you, you know your under tens own an element, like one 10 minute block of, of a training session or something like that. And then that builds up over time. And then by the time they are 15 or 16, um, they're telling you as a coach, they're saying, right, coach, this is what we, we need this for Tuesday night's training session. We need A, B, C. And you're thinking, okay, no worries. Um, we'll, we'll make that happen. And, and they're, they're, they're taking the, the learning themselves. They're taking ownership themselves because at the end of the day, I guess, um, using the coach as a facilitator sort of uh, methodology and philosophy means that we want players to be their own best coaches, don't we? Yeah, and then when you give them that choice you, or you're allowing them input, you're giving them what they want. Mm -hmm. And if you're giving them what they want, it, it keeps them coming back. We, with one of our games recently, that was our question to the playing group is what do you need from us on game day? Mm -hmm. and, and we will provide you with that. Whether, you know, whether it's statistics or tell us what's happening in this part of the game or this part of yeah. the game. And, and that's all we, all we feed them. Nothing else outside of what they've identified as keys to their on-field performance. Um, and yeah, if you can start doing it, it at a young age where, you know, maybe you just let the players come up with the warm up or, or an activity within the game or whatever you finish the session with. Um, so that, yeah, they start thinking for themselves and have input into what's happening. And that's another thing that a lot of coaches roll out is, you know, 
kids these days don't know how to make decisions and but then we don't allow them the opportunity to actually make any <laughs> so, yeah let's let's let them do those things yeah no doubt no doubt okay um look jamie that that's been um fantastic today um hopefully everyone out there has got something out of that as i mentioned earlier in the show notes we're just going to put some links to um some resources some uh really good websites as well that are going to enhance your learning um as well as um an opportunity if uh if, if you wanted to to um maybe contact um, Jamie by email there as well, because I'm sure um, you'd be happy to just to answer a few questions along the line. Um, we'll have our contact details there as well. But thank you very much for your time today, Jamie. I hope you've enjoyed um, sharing your knowledge as well. And um, to everyone out there, thank you very much for, for tuning in and uh, look out for our next session in the Coach and Official Development Series. Thank you very much. Goodbye.